as fantastic the new uh, pills are, which are coming onto the market, they are not silver bullets, really. So next slide, please. You see the antiviral drugs, you know, we talked in the past about the vaccinations, and now we talk about drugs, and we need all of that. We need the vaccines, but we need also therapeutics to treat patients who are sick. Um, when you see the 80 antivirals available, about 80 are available <clears throat> for treating viral infection and 50% of them uh, treat uh, HIV. So because that's the most important, HIV needs daily treatment of at least three different uh, antivirals from two different uh, categories, which is a good business for the pharmaceutical industry. Everything what needs a daily treatment is something good. And therefore, you see there are many more uh, HIV antivirals as there are an example for herpes, where you treat a maximum a week. Um, and no, uh, now, from now onwards, we have a new group of antivirals. These are the one against COVID. Uh, uh, COVID. So the next slide, please. You see, very important for the future, it is to clarify in what stage patients are, because some of these pharmaceuticals are working only in the early stage, some others work only in the very late stage. And there is this very nice uh, description which shows you that there is non-severe disease, there's absence of signs of severe or critical disease, but there's a positive test result. And then we are in the severe area where oxygen uh, drops down under 90%. There are signs of pneumonia, signs of severe respiratory disease. And then we come in the critical stage where you have requires life-sustaining treatment, acute respiratory distress syndrome, sepsis, septic shock. So for all the things, it needs different uh, treatments and the antivirals are used in a, a different way. And that should be... Uh, checked first. Uh, next slide. And you see uh, yeah, there is an emerging use authorization uh, in place for all the vaccines and uh, therapeutics because it takes much longer to get a proper market authorization for the project. So there is this wonder track, Ivermectin. You know, I, in my first uh, period at the, at the pharmaceutical industry, I was part of the clinical research team of Ivermectin, which is an animal health product and was uh, got the first uh, market association in 1981. And it's for livestock as well as for companion animals. And there are various formulations on the market. Uh, it came up as a Ivermectin mainly from Australia, where it showed some uh, uh, efficacy in in um, in trials in lab trials, but not in human beings. And now it's still a hype going on. It's incredible what these discussions on the on the social media about ivermectin and how it helps. And it has to do that even Donald Trump uh, Trump at this time got ivermectin. All the others which you see here, uh, he was treated actually is everything a, a good uh, uh, patients uh, or a guinea pig for, trial, for trials. So ivermectin actually, uh, as I said, was for animal health um, um, approved in 1981. Then it started uh, to be used in human beings. And it was mainly because horses have a parasite, which is the uh, onchoterchosis, and it's similar to the river blindness, a disease which we have in Africa and, and some Asian and South American countries. And uh, we realized that ivermectin is really cleaning up this and in very many, many areas of Africa and South America, um, uh, river blindness is uh, disappeared because of ivermectin as an oral treatment. And if you come to the WHO, you see a big statue there an old man who is blind, and he was there because Merck was at this time donating all these uh, drugs they have developed, 
under the name Mectisan to the WHO and they were, the, they were doing the treatment. So there was no commercial activity in this area. Then uh, uh, ivermectin came out of uh, patent and now there are many generic ivermectins on the market. Some tablets are still in use for head lice in kids and for some parasitic diseases uh, in humans. But they're all disappeared because everybody buys everything what he can get. And now people start, start to use the animal formulations. And quite a number of people died already because the doses, you have to have a high dosage and this high dosage uh, is very toxic. So finally it became very famous because um, a Japanese guy uh, and Campbell from US got in 2015, the Nobel prize for ivermectin use in uh, human beings for the river blindness. And the interesting thing is the soil sample was found on the golf course, and that's why it's important, Michael Victor, that you play with me on Sunday, or maybe you find another soil sample. And, and it was fantastic because it was really effective against the endoparasites and the ectoparasites. Another is the hydroxychloroquine, but you see ivermectin is, uh, there's a warning for use. The same is for hydroxychloroquine. This is the oldest malaria treatment and prophylactic use, even that uh, is not recommended to use. And there's dexamethasone with an NSID. This is a non-structural uh, uh, non, uh, 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 corticosteroid, a non-corticosteroid drug for inflammation. This is used mainly in severely uh, diseased uh, people, because in uh, this in severely disease, people not the virus is the problem; it's just the reaction of the patient to the virus, and this is an over uh, reaction of the inflammation system. And dexamethasone can reduce this inflammation. Next. So then there was a group of monoclonal antibodies. Until uh, yesterday, they were the only antivirals which could be used for COVID-19 uh, and they mimic the natural antibodies needed to fight COVID-19 um, and they target the epitopes, epitopes on SARS-CoV-2 spike protein therefore blocking the virus from entering the cells and they are only recommended for early treatment in high-risk unvaccinated people or, or people who may not mount or react on a uh, vaccination properly. And they can reduce the severe illness when given within five to seven days of symptoms onset. And so there's this small window where you can use it, uh, but they react very quickly and uh, build up a passive immunity, but only for a short period. And now studies are on the way to make long acting monoclonal antibodies. The other negative thing is it needs to be an intravenous administration, difficult to produce, difficult to supply, and a price issue, they are very expensive. The next, and this is uh, Remdesivir, it was the only uh, officially uh, product which had an emergency use acceptance approval. Uh, it was developed to treat hepatitis C and Ebola and uh, was really accelerating recovering about people which are hospitalized with COVID-19. But the effect is that in, in average, it's only four days shorter people are in the hospital. So it's not a, a real big effect. And it's very expensive. You know, the, the one course of treatment, which is six, six days treatment, costs in US between $2,000 and $3,000. And um, this is certainly difficult to have a product with that on the market. But Remdesivir allowed some generic companies to produce it. And there's some uh, companies produce it for low and middle income uh, countries for about $600. Uh, dollars. Again, uh, intravenous treatment, which needs a hospital situation to be able to use it. The next, 
So now these are the new antivirals, Molnupiravir from Merck and Paxlovid from Pfizer. Paxlovid is the trade name, that's why it's in capital letters. Uh, they, they, they just were all uh, reporting first results in November this year. And uh, the results are so um, successful that the clinical trials were stopped and they are both uh, now in the process to get an emergency use authorization for uh, treatment. Um, so, but again, only for people in the early stage in their illness. Um, and they were only looking at uh, do you die or do more by, die or more be hospitalized against uh, placebo groups. Uh, not, none of the studies is peer reviewed. So all the information we have is just straight information from the two companies and uh, uh, can cut hospitalization in days when people are treated soon after infection. And this is a bottleneck. Uh, no pa patient who took either drug died in the studies. Hospitalized patients do not recover faster from COVID-19 if they get these two drugs. But as I said before, in an, a hospitalized situation, the virus is not the problem, it's just only the reaction to the virus. Um, and the most important thing is both can be taken as a pill, so as an oral treatment can be treated, people can treat it themselves, themselves as home. And it's relatively cheap to manufacture. Uh, US has already six for $6.5 billion bought from the two companies this product, so I think it takes again, as it was with the vaccine, a long time until we see this, uh, uh, this pharmaceuticals in the low and middle income countries. Next slide. So a little bit more to Molnupiravir. Uh, the trade name is Lagiviro and it's from Merck, but it's a product which came actually from Richback Biotherapeutics. They have already an emergency use authorization from UK and is so, so far the first one with an uh, authorization, oral for sure, and it reduced the risk of death or hospitalization by about 50% in non-hospitalized adult, adult patients with mild to moderate COVID-19 when treated within five days of symptoms onset. Uh, and it needs a treatment twice a day for five days and the treatment is disrupting the life cycle of the virus and preventing the virus from replicating. And this is a little, for this product a little bit difficult because it's a lot of mutations which are produced within the virus. And so uh, everybody expects it's working nicely against all variants which are on the market, maybe even the new one in South uh, Africa. But uh, people say if it actually triggers mutations, maybe that could be uh, fire back and we have a new mutant which comes up from a, a pharmaceutical product. So there is the European Medicine Agency, which uh, will most likely end of November approve the product for emergency use once from using in pregnancy and using women who plan to get pregnant. Next slide. And this is Paxlovid. This is a Pfizer product. Um, and this has a much better effectiveness. You see 89% of uh, people, um, uh, the risk was reduced by 89% for hospitalization or deaths. And this is an example only 0.8% of the treated patients who are coming into hospital and only uh, versus 7% from the placebo treated, no, not a single dead person in the, in the treated group. Uh, there were a couple of, uh, there were 10 deaf people in the placebo group. So it is, should be used in three days. If you use it in five days after the onset of the symptom, the effectiveness is lower already. The oral treatment every 12 hours for five days, uh, they have submitted to the FDA and, uh, and it works with a specific designed protease inhibitor 
and you know protease, protease is needed for the virus to replicate. Uh, in addition, they ha have to give ritonavir. This is an, an antiviral product which is used in particular for HIV. And this is given because it slows down the metabolism of the medicament and uh, gives a better pharmacokinetic level. Uh, ritonavir, uh, the WHO uh, recently said ritonavir should not be used in uh, for COVID-19 that has no effectiveness. But that's not why it's used here. It's just used to support the other protease inhibitor, which is the main treatment uh, active principle. An interesting aspect is, and you see in the first uh, thigh, I said this is a Pfizer press release from five of, uh, 5th of November, because they are also speculating it, does it reduce the probability of infection following exposure? So if you get the information that one of your contacts have been positive, you could immediately start to use these products and uh, make sure that you are, even in case you are infected, you are not hospitalized or will die. So they have tested in vitro the most variants of concerns which are currently circulating certainly not the, the very new one. And in vitro, it shows that the uh, variants of concern are controlled by this product as well. Uh, and they believe that it will have an effect in many other coronaviruses, which is a long uh, hoped target, you know, that we have not just a pharmaceutical for one coronavirus, but for many others as well. And interesting is the equitable access for all people. They have a tired pricing approach. So you pay a high price in a developed country and a low price in a non-developed country. And um, they are currently in a way trying to find contract manufacturer who may produce it in a, a cheaper way as Pfizer can do it. Uh, they are now already talking to 59 countries where they have purchase agreements in place. But as I said, um, 100 million doses are already of this product going to the US. And they are investing 1 billion to support manufacturing and distribution, particular in the, uh, in the, third, uh, in the in developing world. Uh, the main problem with both products is, you know, the small window you have. You can imagine if you have symptoms then you still may, particularly now in wintertime in Europe or in US, you still believe maybe that's a cold, maybe it's an influenza. Maybe you lose already two days until you go to get a, a test done. And in some countries, you will not get the test done in one day, or you need, and then you need to get a prescription. Uh, and then if you have the pres prescription, you need to go get the, the product from the pharmacy. So if you just, at one day on all of these uh, steps, then you have done, you are out of the five days already and the product doesn't help you. And that's the major pro problem for developing countries. How should this work if you are in a rural area? Easy maybe in a city like Nairobi, uh, if we, you know, uh, enough is produced, but very difficult for other countries. The next. But there's a real race for antiviral drugs to beat COVID-19. So we will expect many more of these products coming to the market. And there is uh, information that currently 320, 320 medicines in various stages of development. Uh, so that's very good news. There is a, a system in place, which is called WHO Solidarity Plus Clinical Trial. This is the idea to repurpose products which are already on the market for other use uh, to test them for COVID-19. And there is a, a, a panel in place with experts and they came up that uh, they are now testing three uh, products. The one is artisanate, it's from ICPA, uh, is used for malaria. So it's artisimin, artisiminin. Uh, the product, as you know, then is imatinib, is for certain can cancers. It's a product from Novartis, 
and there's infliximab, an antibody used for diseases of the immune system, particularly in Crohn's, Crohn's disease. The repurposing has the big um, uh, benefit that we know everything about the safety of this product as long as you use it in the same standard dose as it's used for these diseases. You have already man manufacturing um, in place where you can do this and uh, it can be done very cheap and all these companies have agreed if the products uh, show that they work against COVID-19, they will uh, give it to very low prices to the WHO to distribute it to all countries in the world. Currently, this, this one trial here, the Solidarity Plus clinical trial is rolled out in 52 countries. Um, many of our countries where we have offices are, is, uh, are involved in 600 hospitals, 2000 researchers. Um, so this is really a new and robust uh, approach to evaluate therapeutics which are on the market. The next, there are other in initiatives. There's the COVID-19 therapeutic accelerator, which is funded by Wellcome Trust, MasterCard, by the uh, Gates Foundation, other governments and foundation. And here again, it's the same idea. Look what is available, look at libraries, what um, pharmaceuticals are available and could be tested. Uh, they look mainly from the, it's a little bit like a, our TASL project, you know, from the very beginning proof of concept until really manufacturing and marketing this product. Therefore, all the important uh, pharmaceutical, international pharmaceutical companies are involved in this. And uh, it's a very promising uh, uh, activity. And there's another, uh, that's the largest private public partnership which exists is IMI, is the Innov Innovative Medicine In Initiative. They have about $3.2 billion uh, from 2014 to 2020. And they will get a similar amount for the next four years. And uh, half of this is paid by Horizon 2020. So it's the European Commission and half is paid by FPA. This is the European Federation for Pharmaceutical Industry Association. So these are all the pharmaceutical industry paying the rest of uh, this, um, uh, the half of the 3.2 uh, billion. But uh, they started now to work on horizon, uh, on, on COVID-19. And this is still a low amount, but it's a seed funding. And they have decided to have five focus on diagnostics research. So this is the rapid uh, proof of, uh, proof of uh, care, a point of care, and three new antivirals for the current and future corona outbreaks. And it's done in uh, all of the European countries with all of the um, international pharmaceutical industry there. And uh, it's very promising the activity is going on. My last slide. So what are the conclusion? These two treatments alone aren't likely to close the book on the coronavirus, but there will be a valuable addition to what we have. Most likely not so much in the low and middle income countries, but I think as always, these uh, tracks are further developed and there may be uh, other better solutions in future. But we have the vaccines and now everybody talks about booster shots, particular after the information of, of this uh, South African new variant. We need more antiviral pills and I've shown there's a lot of initiatives going on. Uh, the vi virus fighting antibodies and we need really some antibodies which, which are engineered to stick around in people's bodies, not just only a short term uh, reaction so it should be a long acting antibody. Uh, that would be very helpful. What we need is fast turnaround testing and sequenced or better say role, the rolled regulatory process, which proved so nicely in the vaccines. You know, the reason why the vaccines are available after one year was because of the lot of money which was put into this research. And secondly, because the process with the regulators has changed, there were any 
uh, information which was available was immediately tested. Normally, you have to collect everything. And, you know, we were going with a lorry full of files to the regulatories to, and, uh, to start the process. So and this takes you at least 10 years, and this is different and should be different here as well. Then we need the rapid and really rapid uh, point of care tests. A good one, which are, there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> diagnostic developments going on. Uh, and I think uh, that's another good news for the future. But the most important is we have the non-pharmaceutical interventions, you know, mask distance, uh, all what we do and need to do um, continuously. And that's clear as always, prevention is better than cure and prevention is definitely cheaper than cure. Thank you.